I'm going to show you the most exciting game of round two in the World Cup. It's Wei Yi with the white pieces. It's a very strong Chinese top grandmaster who at some point at 15 years old, he was the youngest player ever to break into the 2700 club. Nowadays, at the age of 24, he is only 27, 26, but still, he is an incredibly dangerous player, fantastic attacking style. And he's playing against another very enterprising player from Brazil. His name is Luis Supi. And I'm going to show you all the highlights of this fascinating encounter, which started off with the Sicilian opening. And after the move d4, we have the open variation leading to my favorite line, the Sveshnikov. I've been following this opening for many years and it uh, got mainly popularized uh, a few years ago again by all the efforts of uh, Magnus Carlsen, who successfully played it in his World Championship match with Fabiano Caruana in London 2018. We know this is a very good opening. Knight db5, black goes d6, and here the move knight d5. It's one of the sharp continuations, uh, was popularized by Fabiano Caruana in that match. And for a long time, the players are following um, one of their critical games. After knight d5, of course, the threat is to play knight c7 with a huge knight fork. So therefore you take on d5, e takes d5, you're attacking the knight and the knight has to go back to an inferior square. But the good news is that white no longer has a piece on d5, which is usually a nice outpost for a knight. But now there is a pawn, so white is no longer able to use that square. We get a different sort of strategy, which I will elaborate a bit on um, in, a, in a few minutes. First things first, where to go with a knight. Personally, I do like the move knight e7 a lot with the idea to bring the knight over to the king side. And that is a great spot for the knight later on to um, set up a sort of a king side attack. But another very nice positional move is knight back to b8. It's not a waste of time because very soon the knight will rejoin play via d7. White plays a4, grabbing space. On the queen side, this was Fabiano's new idea. Bishop e7, bishop e2, castling king side. White can also castling king side, of course, but first he played the move bishop d2, very modest way of developing the bishop, but this is all still pretty standard stuff. Knight d7, the knight comes into play. White goes a5, white is making more advances on the side of the board where it's stronger with pawns on d5. And a5, white is even ready to quickly bring up the b and c pawn as well. White has a majority on that side of the board, whereas black, in return, is going to look for some counterplay on the other wing. Therefore, the move f5 played, white castled, and here black went for the move a6, attacking the knight on the b5, and the knight goes back to a3. Very interesting idea. Now we understand also why the bishop is on d2 because the bishop keeps the pawn protected no time for black to take that pawn and the knight will come back into the game to uh, to c4 that's what happened black marched forward with it with its own pawn e4 knight c4 and the move knight e5 played offering the exchange of knights and uh, white is not interested in training of it himself because after d takes e5 black's pawn block in the middle of the board is potentially a great attacking weapon. F4 will come, maybe E3, maybe F3 at some point. Very dangerous. Instead, white goes for the move knight B6, hitting the rook, rook B8. And now white realizes that, okay, black is very far already with its own pawns. Let's stop the pawn with the move F4. Black is taking en passant. Bishop takes F3. And here, first moment uh, where we get to see a new move in the game, Caruana against uh, Magnus Carlsen from that World Championship match. Magnus played very aggressively with the move G5. That's something I would not recommend anyone to, to do, pushing your pawns in front of your king. It's an interesting approach, but a more sensible continuation would be here to play the move Bishop F6, to activate the bishop, placing it on this diagonal. White went for the move Bishop B4, revealing its plan of Putting pressure against the pawn on d6, making it harder for the queen to, uh, to leave the d8 square, as it needs to retain control over the pawn. And now, anyway, Louis Supi 
played here the move g5 in Magnus Carlsen style. He played this move anyway, but it should be said that probably now the bishop has left the d2 square, black may even have considered playing the move f4. I think that's a very good move with the plan of getting the bishop out. It's more important to play with your pieces than just push your pawns when they are not very well backed uh, by the other pieces. So I think that would have been a, a reasonable uh, move. For instance, if white would play bishop e4 now to prevent the bishop from coming to f5, key idea here is to get the bishop to g4 and attack the queen. Later on, we can even place the bishop on g5. We have not a pawn on g5, so that could be an advantage. And later on, black will try to use the f-pawn to open up white's king side. Let's get back to the game. G5 was played, but I think black soon started to regret this advance of, uh, of its uh, uh, pawn in front of its king. C4, bishop G7, and white played the move queen D2. Very uh, logical move to connect the rooks. Also, the pawn on G5 is uh, under control. So the queen on, um, on D8 cannot do too much. And you see also that as long as that bishop stays on C8, the rook on B8 remains out of play as well. That's why I, I don't really like Black's strategy so far. Black goes for the move f4, and here the bishop comes to a better diagonal. This is a nice spot for the bishop. Black played here the move bishop f5, offering the exchange of bishops, and White thinks, okay, I can exchange these bishops. Played here the move rook a e1. Not a bad move, but definitely capturing yourself on, uh, on f5 comes really strong into consideration as well, because after swapping the bishops, you can push the pawn to c5. And after pawns are getting swapped as well, you do have a very strong, powerful d-pawn, which can be supported with the move rook a to d1. I think white is clearly better in that case. Rook a e1, very understandable, because now if the bishop takes e4, rook takes e4. Looks like the rook is doing well, but also black has multiple um, interesting ideas, including the activation of the queen so that the rook can come over to, uh, to e8. That's a move I like a lot, but the move f3 was played. Louis Supi is on fire with a point, of course, g takes f3, runs into knight takes f3, a deadly knight fork. The knight cannot be taken as the rook is supporting the knight. So that was not seen, of course, and instead white played here the move c5. Important moment. So both sides are trying to play on the side where they are stronger. And I think this pawn on f3 could have stayed here a little longer rather than trading it off. In the game there followed f takes g2, but if you play a move like queen to, uh, to f6, sacrificing the pawn on d6, following it up with queen g6, there are quite a bit of tactical ideas hitting the rook. The d-pawn is not too dangerous, the, the, the rooks are still in control, maybe g4 can be played. And this pawn on f3 is a nuisance, it's very difficult to get rid of it. But f takes g2 was played and that opens up the position in front of the white king. But after queen takes g2, white's pieces, his most powerful pieces, they are guarding the white king very well. Rook takes f1, played, queen takes f1. Now c takes d6 is an idea, d takes c5, bishop takes c5. And here I believe that um, Louis uh, Supi played too aggressively here with the move g4. He wanted to play with its knight, let the knight come into f3, very understandable. But you cannot just play for an attack when the other pieces are not joining the action. A much better move is queen c7, attacking the bishop. And if you think, let's just support it. Now, one step back with bishop f8, you're trying to eliminate the most annoying piece so that once the bishops come off the board, that rook from b8 finally joins the game with the same sort of effect that the rook attacks the queen, covers the f3 square, and you can look for ideas to let the knight come into play. This is incredibly complex, but altogether I think this is a very sensible approach for black. Let's see what happened in the game, because there followed the move g4, but now the white queen comes first. It comes to f5 with a huge threat to take on e5. This is looking incredibly dangerous. Now, if you play queen f6, was not seen in the game. Queen takes, bishop takes, there's a double attack. Hitting the rook, hitting the knight. If you protect with the move rook to e8, I'm pretty sure that Vai Yi has all been calculating it. He's an absolute machine. 
He had seen here the move knight e7, I'm 100% sure. With a point, of course, the knight is pinned. If you take on d7, the rook on e8 is hanging. The alternative is knight f3. With a discovered check, you're about to win the rook. But if you go king g2 and take the rook now, it's knight takes f6. You're capturing the bishop with check. King has to move on the next move. You take with your knight that rook and white is a piece up. These tactical lines, they are so important. But white is now dominating the middle of the board. And that's why the tactics are working in his favor. Louis Soupy played knight f3 check. And you have to be very careful because the king doesn't have many good squares. If you go to g2, it's knight h2, uh, sorry, knight h4 with a very annoying knight fork. You're winning the queen while after the move king to f1, there is another fork on d2 winning the exchange. So the only move for white is king h1. Queen c7 setting up a very nasty mating threat. But look at the next move. It's the move d6. You're attacking the queen, neutralizing the threat. And of course, it's important that now the fifth rank has been opened. The queen on f5 is supporting the bishop, which means that the black queen is not able to take on c5. The queen goes to c6. Looks very dangerous as well. You're basically not allowing white to move the rook because that will allow a deadly discovered check. But look what is going to be played here. One of the most insane moves of the tournament so far. The move knight c8. You may think why to place the knight on, on that square. It can just be captured by, uh, by the queen. But if you take with the queen it's d7 and you're attacking the queen. Rook e8 is an, is an idea. This looks very bad. In the game there followed rook takes c8. But the point is that now there is this move d7. You're advancing the pawn with gain of time. Hitting the rook. Now the rook needs to choose where it goes. It went to f8, but a much more logical move, in my opinion, would be to play rook d8. Why not place the rook in front of that passed pawn? The d pawn doesn't look dangerous. It's, it's in control. But Vayi, once again, has calculated like an absolute machine. There is this move, rook e8, deflecting the main defender of the passed pawn. Rook takes e8. Now, better don't take back, because the queen protects the e8 square. But Vayi had planned here to move queen d5, rook sacrifice, and now a queen sacrifice with check. You're about to take on c6, and then you can play d takes e8. It's game over. If you take the queen, it's d takes e8, queen with check. You're piece down, but there's only one way to block the check. It's bishop f8, and it's checkmate, thanks to the support of the bishop. What an absolutely insane line calculated by, by white, starting with this move knight c8. But let's have a look what happened after the move rook f8. Rook attacks the uh, the queen. And now you, you may think, okay, you can you can take with, uh, with a bishop. But if you do that, if you take here with a bishop, there is the move queen to c1. And after king g2, it's queen to g1 with checkmate. Don't do that. You have to look for forcing moves. It's a very tricky, subtle move, this rook f8. But much stronger is queen takes f8, sacrificing the queen. After bishop takes, you don't capture the rook now with your d pawn, but you promote it to the d8 square, threatening checkmate on f8. So queen takes e4, it's queen takes f8 with the same mating pattern as in the other line. Therefore, the bishop needs to be eliminated. Queen takes c5. Black has a bishop and a knight and a pawn for the rook. Looks good news, but it's white's move. No time for black to play queen g1 with checkmate because there follows... Rook takes g4 with check, and this is crushing. If you go king h8, it's queen f6 with mate to follow. King has to go, therefore, to f7, but now it's rook f4 with check. King has to move again, and now you can deal with this mating threat on g1 by eliminating that knight on f3. Now white is a full exchange up. Black's king is wide open. Black resigned here because, materially speaking, it's just hopeless. White has a mating attack. Well, you can just give one more check. Queen c1, king g2, queen c2. You cannot go to the default because this has been covered by the white queen. The king can go to h3. The king is absolutely safe on h3. The checks are over. So that explains Black's resignation. I thought this was the most impressive game of round two. But... 
There is much more to see. And in a separate video, I'm going to have a look at another very exciting game played in the second round. But stay tuned for more updates because this is the most exciting event of the year, at least in my opinion. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye-bye.